of an incredible personality. A being no larger than an ordinary man, but possessed of powers never before realized on Earth. Faster than an airplane, more powerful than a locomotive. Well, good morning to everybody in the room here at Buckhead. And I wanna say a good morning to everybody watching at North Point, Browns Bridge, and everybody that's uh, sitting at home watching us online. Glad that you guys are all joining us as we continue a message series that we have been in for the last few weeks called Heroes. And if you haven't been with us, kind of the main idea is simply what we have said is that heroes are some people who they save the day. Heroes save the day. And we've been talking every single week about how you and I uh, can learn to become more heroic in our lives. And this series for me has been a little frustrating and it's been a little difficult because when I look in the mirror and see myself in the morning, the first thing that I think of is not hero. I think of a lot of other things. And so through this series, it's been hard for me to kind of grasp what we're talking about because I don't think of myself as a hero. I started asking myself the question like, what? what was the last heroic thing that I did? And I couldn't really come up with a good answer. So I just thought I would ask you the same question I've been asking myself. Like, what was the last heroic thing that you did? Like, what story would you tell if someone asked you this question? And of course, some of you who are amazing would have an incredible story to tell because you've literally saved someone's life. There was a point you saved someone from drowning, you gave someone a kidney, like you stood up to a bully at school and saved the day. Some of you guys have done things like truly heroic and set up your parents' wireless router at their house. (laughs) There's people that don't come back from that. I mean, that is true hero's journey right there. I mean, what would you say? It was hard for me to to answer that question. And I think the reason it was difficult for me to answer that question, and I don't know, it may be difficult for you to answer that question, is because I just don't think a hero is someone who saves the day. I think a hero is someone who saves the day in like a really big way, right? A hero saves tons of lives. A hero saves the world. A hero, and, and by their actions, they alter history in some form or fashion. And when I, when I think of heroes, my first thought is not superheroes, right? I don't think Batman, I don't think Superman, um, I, I don't think Spider-Man. The, the heroes that I think of are our real life heroes. The ones who've like really made a difference in this world. I mean, the people I think of are Martin Luther King. Right? This is a real hero. This is someone who changed and altered the course of history. This is someone who gave his life to fight for racial reconciliation and to pursue civil rights, things that we're still fighting for today. I think of Mother Teresa, who spent her whole life, poured her whole life, entire life out, loving the unlovable, touching the untouchable. She changed the course of history. I think of people like Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela spent 20 plus years in prison, but the whole time this unwavering commitment to end apartheid and change the course of an entire nation and in the entire world. Like the, these are heroes. And when I think about me being a hero compared to what these people have done in their lives, there's just no way I immediately disqualify myself. I've never even met this, these, these people, obviously. And I think probably most of us in the room never got to meet these people. But then you do meet people that are in your life that are doing things that are just absolutely incredible. Have you met people that you don't even like to stand in their shadow because of what they're doing? I, I, I wanted to tell you the story about a lady that I've met recently, her name is B. And B is just an incredible woman. She is an incredible hero. And I was actually talking with her yesterday. I told her that I was gonna tell uh, you guys her story and she would not allow me to show you a picture of her. So I wanted to show you a picture of B, but she said, no, I'm not gonna allow you to show my face to thousands of people. If you're gonna tell my story, you're not gonna show my face, which kind of just tells you what kind of person she is. She's amazing. She's incredibly humble. So what I want you to do is just for quickly, just imagine an amazing picture of B, right? (laughs) She's here and she's amazing. Okay, B lives uh, not too far away from here in Clarkston, Georgia. All right, and what B does is she, well, what B did is she, nine years ago, she quit her job and she quit her career. She had a 30 year career uh, in the banking and insurance agencies. All right, she had, an, she had an incredible career, but she always felt like they had, she had a different calling on her life. So nine years ago, she quit her job, quit her career, and she transformed her home into a facility to take care of the elderly. 
And so nine years ago, she took her personal home, took a ton of money and transformed it so she could take care of elderly people and give them dignity in their last days on earth. And the reason I got to meet B is because B takes care of my grandmother. So 14 months ago, uh, my grandmother was living with my parents and her um, medical issues and her health problems grew to the point where my family was no longer medically like capable of taking care of her. So they needed to move her to a facility where she could be watched, you know, 24 hours a day. And so we moved her into B's house and B's just become kind of this little extension of our family. She ate Thanksgiving uh, dinner with us. And so I've got to interact with her over the course uh, of the last several months. And she's just an incredible woman. All right, she's had 12 clients that have lived in her home over the last nine years. And she's watched you know, all of them uh, grow and many of them have passed away. And she was telling me not too long ago that she's had three of her clients just pass away in her arms. She held them as they kind of took their, her last breath. And B doesn't have any children, all right? She's, she's probably in her mid, late 50s and never had any children. So she just considers uh, these elderly folks who live in her home as part of her family, as part of her children. So it's really difficult when, you know, the, these people that she loves pass away. And I was just asking her, I'm like, how? How are you doing this? I mean, why did you give up this incredible career and do all these amazing things just to spend your days in your house taking care of people? And she said this, this, and this is a quote. She goes, you might think I'm crazy. She says, but I love being with them when they leave to see the Lord. She says, it's my purpose to make sure that they are comfortable and to make sure they know it's okay to go. And B told me in, in the midst of this conversation, she said she won't allow any of her clients that pass away to leave the house. She won't allow the coroner to take the body until she's had a chance to completely dress them. And she said that the reason that she does this, she, goes, she, she doesn't want any of her clients leaving the house in their pajamas. She doesn't want any of her clients uh, leaving the house in, in a medical gown. She goes, I want them completely dressed. And here's why. So when they walked into my house for the very first time, they were dressed and they had their dignity. And so when they leave my house for the very last time, they're gonna be dressed and they're gonna have their dignity. And she's sitting here telling me this and I'm going, I'm a horrible person, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm happy if I get through the day having not eaten carbs for every meal. <laughs> Meanwhile, she is saving lives and sacrificing. I mean, and when I look at myself and go, am I a hero, right? Compared to what B's doing and compared to what Nelson Mandela is doing and what Martin Luther King, no, I don't think that at all. So I wanna ask us a different question. I think it's a question that's maybe a little bit easier for us to answer. Instead of what was the last heroic thing you've done, I wanna ask you, what was the last heroic thing someone did for you? So what was the last heroic thing someone did for you? Or maybe I can ask it another, another way. Like who was the last person to be a hero for you and why? And I think this is gonna be a little bit easier question for us to answer. And you know, some of us are still gonna have an amazing story where someone actually saved your life. But most of us, when we think of the person who was last a hero for us and why, is we're probably gonna you know, think of someone who saved our lives in really ordinary ways, but really impactful ways. All right, we're gonna think of someone who maybe helped us when it was inconvenient, someone who invested in us when they didn't have to, someone who gave their time when they didn't have a lot of margin, you know, someone who gave their resources to us when they looked at our lives and, and we were a total mess and a complete risk. Like, we're, gonna, we're gonna look back on people who did little things for us all along the way. And probably when they were doing it at the time, we didn't realize they were heroes. It's only in hindsight that we really realize that people were heroes and we look back and we see all the little random acts of kindness that they did for us that have now kind of grown into hero status for us. But who do you think of? My guess is there's someone, there's a person in your life that immediately comes to mind and maybe, maybe it's a spouse or someone who put their career on hold or so that you could reach your goals. Maybe it's a friend, somebody who stood by you and was patient with you and like all the other friends walked out of your life and they walked out for good reason. But you had this one friend that just continually never gave up on you. Maybe it's a dad who you know risked his financial future for your education or for your startup. Or maybe it's your single mom who worked in multiple jobs to, kind of to do the same thing for you. Maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a coach, somebody in high school, somebody in college, and they just spent an inordinate amount of time with you for no other reason, no other apparent reason than the fact that for some reason they just believed in you. When you think of a hero, maybe you think of your son, maybe you think of your daughter, someone who just kind of like forgave you, you know, over and over again when it looked like you weren't changing and you weren't around. Like when we think of the, the people who are heroes for us, we think of people who gave up something, they gave up their time, they gave up their energy, they gave up their resources, they gave up their position, maybe their ambition and their goals for us. They sacrificed for us. And the heroes that we think of are the heroes who sacrificed part of their life for your life. They sacrificed part of their life for your life, which is what a hero does. A hero always 
Sacrifices. A hero always sacrifices. Right? A hero always gives something up. A hero always lays something down. A hero always has to say no to something. And they're able to do this because they see something that needs saving. They look out there and they see something that needs saving. They have an aim, they have a goal. They see something out there that's of value. And they say, you know what? It's worth losing something. It's worth sacrificing something to get that. And we all know what a sacrifice is, right? A sacrifice is this idea that you're gonna let something die now, right? You're gonna say no to something now in order that something can live later, right? And this is a brilliant idea. In fact, like when you think about it, sacrifice is really one of the only ways that we have of helping create and shape our own future. Like we get to participate in bringing the future to bear by sacrifice. We're making a bargain with the present so that we can ensure something in the future. And our heroes, like the ones that we think of, I mean, that's exactly what they did. They saw something in us. They saw a future in us. And they said, you know what? I'm gonna help create. I'm gonna help lean in. I'm gonna help shape that future. And they sacrificed on our behalf to create that future for us. And if you've ever had anybody do that for you, like, you know, it's amazing. Like it is absolutely incredible. I mean, some of us could probably get a real emotional real quick when you think back to what they did for you last year, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when someone sacrifices for us on our behalf, it is amazing. It's like, we know that intuitively, there's just nothing better than that. It feels so meaningful. Like in a way it feels ultimate. Like who could do anything else for us? What could be better? What could be higher? What could be more noble? What could be more heroic? than someone sacrificing in our behalf. And Jesus agrees. Jesus said this, he said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. So Jesus agrees with us. He said, there really isn't anything better than when someone sacrifices for you. There's not a greater love than when someone looks at you, looks at your future, looks at your potential and says, I'm gonna sacrifice to help bring that to bear. I'm gonna lay something down and I'm gonna say no. It's incredible when someone does this for us. And when we see sacrifice, it can bring tears to our eyes. I mean, we love sacrifice. We love it. It is beautiful when we see it. It is beautiful when we see someone participating in it. Like I said, we cry at movies where this is the main theme. We love sacrifice as long as it's someone else who's doing it. (laughs) We love sacrifice, as long as it's someone else that we see that's doing the sacrificing. We love to see other people say no, We love to see other people deny themselves. We love to see other people lay their life down for the sake of other people. We love it, it's incredible. We just don't wanna have to do it ourselves. We know this about ourselves, we don't wanna deny ourselves anything. Like what's the worst thing we can tell ourselves? No, that's the worst thing we can tell ourselves. We never wanna tell ourselves no. We think we deserve what we want now and we think what we deserve what we want later, right? And we, we would probably never say that or articulate it that way, but so often that's what we feel. None of us, none of us love to sacrifice. We hate it, it's difficult. In fact, sacrifice for us is so hard that for a lot of us in the room, There are things in your life that need saving. There's things in your life that you know need saving, but you won't save them. There's things things that you have in your life right now that you know need saving, but you aren't willing to save them because you're gonna have to sacrifice in order to save it. However, some of us in the room, we know our health needs saving. We know we're not doing good. We know we're getting older. We know the pounds are getting on. We know we find ourselves out of breath when we send a tweet, right? (laughs) It's just like 140 characters, it's just too much. We know it's not good, but we don't wanna sacrifice, right? We don't wanna change the way that we eat. We don't wanna exercise. We don't wanna sacrifice our sleep. We don't wanna sacrifice sugar. It's too difficult. Some of us, we know our finances need saving, right? The debt continues to grow and Zappos keeps calling, right? And we keep answering the phone because there's things that we want. Right? And we don't wanna sacrifice in order to save our finances. We know our savings is non-existent, but we don't wanna stop the shopping. We don't wanna stop the clothes. We wanna stop getting the shoes. We don't wanna stop going on the vacations, right? We don't wanna stop playing golf. We don't wanna give up whatever is demanding our money. For some of us, you know you have a relationship that needs saving. And you've got a relationship with a friend. You've got a relationship with a roommate. 
Some of you guys are in a relationship with a son or a daughter and the relationship is broken and you know it needs saving, but you look at the situation and go, what it's gonna take for me to sacrifice in order to save that? I don't know, it, it's too much. If I move in their direction, it's gonna look like I'm condoning their behavior. It's gonna look like I'm condoning their lifestyle. It's just too much for me to have to sacrifice and move in their direction. For some of us, you have a marriage that needs saving. Right? And you know it, you know it hasn't been good for a while. Right? It's been difficult for the last two years. It's been difficult for the last five years and you both know it. But what it's gonna take to begin to save your marriage is sacrifice and no one wants to do that. You don't wanna have to stop doing things that you love to do and you don't wanna have to start doing things that you don't wanna do. And so you just kind of continue. You just kind of live in your camps and you live in your tribes and you have the same fights over and over again and it's not getting better. Some of you have a future that needs saving, right? You know the way that you're currently living is not gonna lead you to the place you know you ultimately want to be, but you don't wanna stop, it's just too fun. Life is too good right now. I know I'm gonna regret this later. I know my future needs saving, but I just don't wanna stop. Some of you, your future needs saving and you're in a relationship right now that you know is not gonna lead you to where you ultimately wanna be, but you don't wanna sacrifice the relationship. You don't wanna risk, you don't wanna risk being lonely. But sacrifice, and we see things that need to be saved, sacrifice is so difficult for us. And even when we know these things need saving, and even when for a lot of us, we know that there's people in our life that we love and our decision not to step in and say this is affecting them, we're still unwilling to do it. And it's not because we don't believe in it. No one would say they don't believe in sacrifice. We believe in sacrifice. We know it matters. We know when people have done for us, it's changed us, it's shaped us, it's moved our life forward. We know heroes sacrifice. We know heroes always sacrifice. We know that we can't save the day without sacrifice. We just don't want to have to do it ourselves. We don't wanna give up anything now, even though we know we want a better future. We don't wanna have to say no to something now so that we can say yes to something later. And so we all just kind of live in this tension between what we know and what we believe in and how we actually wanna act in our lives. We all live in that tension between what, believe, what we believe and what we know and then how we actually live our lives. And so we live in this tension of things that we know need saving, but we're not willing to sacrifice to save it. And in this tension, here comes Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. This is what Jesus says about this whole issue. He says, whoever wants to save their life, by the way, who wants to save their life? That's everybody. Oh, you're gonna lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so what do you do with this? Because Jesus comes along and says, hey, if there's something that you wanna save, the only way you can save it is if you're, you're willing to lose it. Which you're going, wait, how does that even work? What do, I mean, what do we do with this? Because Jesus said this in a conversation that he was having with his disciples about the idea of sacrifice. And I want us to look at this conversation together that Jesus had. Because I think in the conversation, we're gonna uncover a belief that the disciples had. And I think it's a belief that a lot of us have, even though we may not be aware of it. And this belief is one of the things that keeps us from saving the things in our lives that we know need saving. And so I want us to look at this conversation, but before we jump into it, I wanna back up and give you, just give, you, give you guys just a little bit of context to what was happening right before Jesus had this conversation with his disciples. Immediately before, early in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked his disciples, guys, who do you say that I am? Like, who do you think I am? And the reason he's asking that is because there's a lot of rumors that were swirling around about who Jesus was. All right, some people just thought he was a good man. Some people thought he was just a good teacher. Other people thought he was a prophet. And some people thought he was a prophet reincarnated. All right, some people thought that he was the Old Testament prophet Elijah or Jeremiah who was reincarnated and showed up on the scene. So there's all these rumors swirling around about who is Jesus? And so he turns to his disciples and he says, guys, who do you think I am? And Peter kind of steps up and he answers on behalf of all the disciples. I'm paraphrasing here, but Peter kind of gets the courage and says, well, Jesus, we think you're the son of God, right? We think you're the Messiah. We think you're the savior. You're the hero that we have been waiting for to come and set us free and restore Israel to a new nation, set us free from the rule of Rome. He said, that's who we think you are. You know, you can just see Peter saying that, and there's like this like pregnant pause in the air as he just kind of just like waits to answer and all the disciples going, what is he gonna say? And then Jesus just gives them the best answer they could have ever hoped for. I mean, Jesus says, you're right. That is exactly who I am. I am the son of God. I am the hero that you have been waiting for. And you gotta imagine that moment, the disciples are like, 
mind blown, right? This is incredible. You are who we have hoped for. You are who we are, have waited for. And then Jesus just goes on and he just tells them the most amazing thing they could possibly hear. Jesus goes on and goes, yep, I'm the hero. I'm the son of God. And guess what I'm about to do? I'm about to establish a kingdom here on this earth that the gates of hell will not be able to stand against. And I mean, that's just like the best language the disciples could ever see. That's when they're like, that's what I'm talking about, Jesus. We're gonna build a kingdom, gates of hell, gates of Shmel. We're gonna do something incredible. And they're so fired up. You gotta think, this is like the best, imagine like if you played sports in high school, this is the best locker room speech they have ever heard. They are so excited. Their hero is here and he's gonna about to do something serious on the earth and the gates of hell are not even going to be able to stop it. Let's go tackle the world. And then that's the emotion with which Jesus kind of turns the conversation. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. So from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. So Jesus just told him he was the hero. He just told him the gates of hell are not gonna stand against what he's about to do. And then the very next thing he tells him is that he is going to die. This is the best locker room speech followed by the worst playbook in history. The disciples literally have no idea what to do with this information. All right, this makes zero sense to them. Jesus, you just told us you were the hero. You just told us you've come to save the day. Now you've told us you're gonna die. Listen, Jesus, heroes do not win by dying. Heroes win by winning. That's how heroes win. And you're telling us that you're gonna go and die on a cross? That's not what heroes do. People who die on a cross in Rome, they're forgotten. Right, their bodies are thrown on the trash heap and they don't change anything. They don't conquer anything. And if you've ever read any of the gospels, you'll find that Jesus, he tells his disciples over and over and over again what he's gonna do. I mean, it shouldn't be any surprise to the disciples what ultimately happens to Jesus because Jesus tells them time and time again that he's gonna go to Jerusalem. This isn't the only time he told them this, that he's gonna suffer and that he's gonna die and that he's gonna be raised to life. And when you read the gospels, it's every single time the disciples, it's like their eyes glaze over. It's like Jesus has never said anything. They completely ignore Jesus when he says it or they completely change the subject because it makes no sense to them. And to us, when we read it, we kind of know the end of the story and we're going, how come the disciples did not pay attention to the fact that Jesus told them he was going to be raised from the dead, that he was gonna be raised to life? Well, the reason I don't think the disciples paid attention to that is because that's crazy, okay? No one would believe that. The disciples love Jesus. All right, they followed him around. They saw him doing all kinds of miracles. But let's be honest, Jesus said some crazy things. In my estimation, the disciples just kind of had this little bucket. They kind of kept on the side. This is like crazy things Jesus says bucket. And when they said he was gonna die and be raised to life, I think they just went, that's a crazy thing that Jesus says because that's insane. No one comes back from the dead. So when you read that and they ignore it, of course they did. So the disciples have no idea what to do with this information. But Peter this time, for whatever reason, he decides he's gonna confront Jesus, right? Most of the time they ignore, most of the time they change the subject. But Peter decides this time, I'm gonna have a conversation with Jesus about what he just said. And so he kind of takes Jesus aside and this is what he tells Jesus. Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And I think in Peter's response, we get a little glimpse of a belief that Peter had and we get a little glimpse of a, a belief that the disciples had. And I think we get a little bit of insight into a belief that all of us had. And that's the belief that there has to be another way. Like we all think when there's something that needs to be saving and it comes to us having to sacrifice to save it, we go, wait a minute, <laughs> there's gotta be another way. We don't wanna have to go through that. Like I can figure this out. Yeah, I know my health needs saving, right? But can't you just give me a pill? Isn't there like a, like a shake I can take every single day and I, don't, I can continue to eat the way I want to and I don't have to exercise? I mean, that's exactly what we're looking for. All right, somebody give me a shortcut. Now, this is every like multi-level marketing scheme that's out there in the whole world. It's a shortcut. Now, if that's your thing, I love it. Keep selling me things on Facebook. You're awesome. I wanna buy all of your stuff and your oils and lotions and all the things. It's like super great. But, you know, but in, 
what those are is they're playing to that thing of like, there's gotta be an easier way. I don't actually have to sacrifice to do something. I just wanna kind of drink something and I wanna rub something on my temples and change everything. Right, and, th- and this is how we operate in life. Some of us, we, like we want a different relationship with our kids, right? But we don't wanna stop traveling, right? And we don't wanna actually put our phones down at night and actually talk to our kids. And so what do we do? It's like, well, let's just keep buying them more stuff and let's just keep putting them in front of screens so they don't wanna have to talk to us either. That's gonna solve the problem, right? A lot of us, we, we know we want a great marriage, but we don't wanna have to sacrifice. We think there's gotta be another way. All right, so let's just take another vacation. Let's just have another kid as if that's gonna solve the problem. All right, let, we haven't talked in two years, but this Valentine's Day, I'm going all out. All right, this is gonna change everything. We're always looking, right, for a quick fix. We don't ever want to have to go through the sacrifice. And Peter's going, never, Lord, there's gotta be, there's gotta be another way. And we really do believe it. And we would never probably articulate this either. You'd never say this out loud to anyone. But in a way, I think we all think we're smart enough and talented enough to figure out another way to do it. We all do. We all think we can save the relationship. We all think we can save our finances without having to sacrifice. I'm gonna figure this out, right? And so we go, I may not figure it out today, but I'll figure it out next week. By the time the kids leave the house, I'll figure it out. But once I've paid this off, then I'm gonna figure it out. All right, we kind of just continue to go, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I'm gonna push this down the road a week or two weeks or six months or two years. I'm smart enough to figure this thing out. I used to watch a lot of Simpsons when I was growing up. And I remember this one episode where Homer and Marge are having this argument. And of course, it's the same argument all married couples have. It's like, you're supposed to be doing something, but of course he didn't wanna do it. And in the middle of this argument, Homer just kind of pulls out this half-eaten jar of mayonnaise. He pulls out the half-eaten jar of mayonnaise and he pulls out a bottle of vodka and he pours the whole thing in the half-eaten jar of mayonnaise, shakes it up, and then he drinks the whole thing down. And as he's drinking this thing, you hear Marge on, you know, kind of off screen going, Homer, I don't think that's a very good idea. And Homer's response is, that's for future Homer to deal with. <laughs> and of course, then he falls on the ground and convulses. And that picture to me is just, is a perfectly illustrates how a lot of us just live our lives. It's like, I know this isn't a good idea. I know this isn't a good idea. I know this isn't gonna save the day. I know this isn't gonna fix the problem, but that's for future me to deal with. I'm gonna figure it out later, which is exactly what Peter did. Don't do this, there's gonna be another way. To which Jesus responds to Peter in the most incredible way. This is how Peter responds to Jesus. So Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. How would you like if Jesus looked you in the face and called you Satan? (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And I've heard people uh, try to get, let Jesus off the hook a little bit here. And he goes, he's not really calling Peter Satan. He's calling Satan, Satan, but Peter just happened to be standing there. Well, listen, you can interpret that any way you want to, but I bet I know what it felt like to Peter as Jesus turned to Peter and called him Satan. It, what, I mean, Jesus basically just loses it on Peter here. And why did... Why did he lose it on him? Why did he call him Satan? Why is Jesus so mad at Peter in this moment for going, there's gotta be another way. All he was doing was looking out for him. Why is he so mad at him? I think one of the reasons is because Jesus, we forget. Jesus was human too. Jesus didn't wanna do this. Jesus didn't wanna suffer. Jesus didn't wanna have to sacrifice. And we know this because all the way up into the, before he went to the cross in the garden of Gethsemane, he was on his knees praying, saying there's gotta be another way. There's gotta be another way. I don't want to have to drink this cup. Jesus was just like us. He knows exactly what it's feel like to wish there was another way. And he's so frustrated at Peter because Peter is coming in and he's just speaking right into that temptation that all of us feel to not want to have to sacrifice in order to save something. And he calls him Satan because Satan's a liar and Satan is a deceiver. And in that moment, Jesus is like, I don't need to be lied to. I don't need to be deceived. And, and he comes and he says, you know, all you have in mind, Peter, is merely human concerns. And we know what human concerns are, don't we? I mean, human concerns are always short-term concerns. They're always short-term concerns. How am I gonna feel now? What am I gonna have to give up now? Is this gonna make me feel small? Is this gonna make me feel little? Is it gonna make her feel big? Is it gonna seem like they're winning? What am I gonna have to sacrifice? Am I gonna be inconvenienced? Am I gonna be embarrassed? Am I gonna be the one who's gonna be pushed aside again? Human concerns are always short-term concerns about how we feel right here in the moment. And, and 
in a, in a huge way, I mean, human concerns are sacrifice in reverse, right? A sacrifice, as we talk about it, it's sacrificing the short term and for the long term, but a human concern is always sacrificing the long term for the short term. And that is a terrible trade. That is an awful trade because we're sacrificing what we really want for what we want right now. I mean, human concerns are always sacrificing what we really want, life and healthy relationships and a future where there's hope and a future where there is joy and a future where there is less regret. That's what we really want. But when we focus on what we want right now, we sacrifice that. And look, and Jesus goes on, I mean, he, he tells us in this conversation that if you do that, if you try to sacrifice the long-term for the short-term, you're gonna lose it all. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, this is, then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And essentially, what this whole passage of scripture means is Jesus is saying, you know what? There are no loopholes to find life. There really isn't another way. As badly as you want there to be another way, there are no loopholes. There's one road and one way in order for you to find the life that you want and for you to, or in order for you to save things that need to be saving. It's sacrifice and it's profound and it's brilliant, but it's awful and it's terrible. And why is it so awful and why is it so terrible? Because Jesus gives us an invitation in this passage of scripture. He just says, the invitation is to follow him. I just want you to follow me. Well, where are you going, Jesus? Well, he's going to the cross. And who wants to go there? Nobody wants to go there. Because you know what the cross is? I mean, the cross is the sum total of two of our greatest fears as human beings. You guys know what our two greatest fears as human beings are. It's at the top of the list every time they do a, a list of the greatest fears that everybody's afraid of. Our greatest fears are fear of dying and a fear of public speaking, right? Those are the two greatest fears that human beings have. You guys know the joke, right? You'd rather be in the casket than given the eulogy, right? And that's true for so many of us. And I really don't think this is just my opinion that anybody's greatest fear is public speaking. That's no one's greatest fear. You know what everybody's greatest fear is? It's public humiliation. That's what we really fear, right? You've had the dreams where you're standing in front of a crowd on a stage and you're naked. Anybody ever had this dream? This happens all the time for people. I mean, that is the scariest thing in the world, right? To expose yourself to the judgment of the group. That's horrible for us. To stand there with no clothes on and have everybody look at our self-evident flaws and cast judgment on us. And you take that fear of public humiliation and you take that fear of death, sacrifice just puts these two things together, a fear of dying and a fear of humiliation. Right? We have a fear of dying, of, uh, of death to our ego and death to our pride and death to our wants. It's a physical death, but we, we fear just as much these little deaths that take place in our lives every single day. That's why we get so mad when we've been waiting you know, on the exit ramp at 400 for 15 minutes and someone just comes in and cuts right in front of us. That's like a little death. And that's why we get so mad and so frustrated at these people. I do not want to give up my place in line. I'm not gonna die to my place in line. I can't stand you, right? And you just tailgate them all the way up. We hate death, right? And we hate humiliation. We don't wanna feel less than. We don't wanna deny ourselves. We don't wanna feel small, which is what happens when you sacrifice. You, you feel humiliated in that moment because you're taking the less, lesser position. So it is, it is no wonder it is no wonder we don't wanna sacrifice. It's no wonder we don't wanna do it. We have to follow Jesus to the cross and face two of the greatest fears in our life, a fear of death and a fear of public humiliation. And that is exactly what Jesus did. When Jesus went to the cross, he took on the two greatest fears simultaneously. He died and he died in the most publicly humiliating way that anybody's ever died in history. He did that for you and he did that for me to show us that how much he loves us and to show us that no matter what you're afraid of, you're willing to sacrifice. There is always gonna be life on the other side of it. So you know how Jesus was able to go through what he went through? I don't know everything, but I think part of it was the fact that he was always able to focus on the fact that there was going to be a resurrection. He believed it. 
He believed that if he went through it, if he believed, if he sacrificed, there was gonna be life on the other side. That is so hard for us to do. That was so difficult for the disciples to do. When we know that there's something that needs saving, all we tend to focus on is the sacrifice. All we tend to focus on is the suffering. All we tend to focus on is how is this gonna make me feel and the little deaths and the humiliations that we're gonna experience. Jesus, he had all those thoughts but he kept his eyes focused on the prize. He kept his eyes focused on the life and on the resurrection. He knew that a resurrection was worth dying for. He knew that a resurrection was worth going through the sacrifice. He knew that sacrifice always brings life. Sacrifice always brings life. And we know this. You don't have to be a church person to believe this. You don't have to be a Christian to believe this. You know this is true. This happens every spring. We come out of the winter, we're what? Everything dies. But we know when spring, life literally is going to spring forth. There is always life after sacrifice. And this is the closest thing that you're, you're probably ever going to get to a formula in Christianity. If everybody tells you there's, there's formulas and this is how you do things, none of that's true. This is about as close as you're gonna get. And that is to the belief that if you sacrifice, there's gonna be life on the other side of it. If you wanna save your marriage, this is the pattern. It's death and resurrection. If you wanna save your marriage, you've gotta believe it's sacrifice to life. If you wanna save your health, there's one way. It's sacrifice to life. You wanna save the relationship with your kids. You wanna save the relationship with your parents. You wanna save the relationship with your best friend. There's only one way sacrifice to life. You wanna save your future and you wanna have a future of less regrets. It's only one way you can do it. It's sacrifice to life. And I, what that life looks like, there's no guarantee for that. But I know there's no guarantee of life without you going through the sacrifice first. And here's the thing, like when we think about this, like it just all becomes so clear to us. We don't wanna suffer and we don't wanna sacrifice to save what it is we know we're saving. But the irony is we're already suffering. Like we're already miserable. It's already hard. When you're in a place you don't wanna be in a relationship that needs saving, you're already miserable. So why not go ahead and suffer and make yourself miserable in a way that actually brings life by laying yourself down and denying yourself and saying no and moving in their direction. At least suffer in a way that makes sense. Suffer in a way that's gonna bring a promise of a resurrection on the other side. This is the way that our life is supposed to be lived. See, Jesus' death and resurrection, this isn't only an event that we believe in in history, which it is. And Jesus' death and resurrection isn't just a theological belief that we hold to, which it is. But Jesus' death and resurrection, it's the actual pattern of how we're supposed to live our lives in relationships. We're supposed to practice and follow after Jesus into his death and resurrection every day and every moment in every situation at work and at home. This is how we're supposed to live our lives. Jesus said, we're supposed to take up our cross. In another place, he said, we're supposed to take up our cross daily. And that's a hard way to live. But it's the only way that promises the life that we ultimately want to have. Jesus, we, when we see what he did for us, Jesus knew that death would never have the last word. Death is never going to have the last word. He knew there was a resurrection on the other side and it would lead to a life and not just a life, but a life that was unimaginable, a life that was fuller than you could possibly imagine. It would lead to a life that was literally unrecognizable. Do you know that after Jesus was raised to life and after he came back from the dead that no one recognized him? So when Mary came to the tomb and she was having a conversation, she had no idea it was Jesus. She thought it was the gardener. And after she left, and after Jesus left Mary, he went and met some of his disciples and they walked for hours along a road and they had no idea it was him. No one recognized him. Resurrection changes you and it makes you unrecognizable in the most unbelievable way. I want your marriage to be unrecognizable. I want your life to be unrecognizable. I want your relationship with your kids to be unrecognizable in six months, in a year, in five years. That's what I want for you. That's what Jesus wants for you. He wants you to live a life of resurrection, of sacrifice that leads to life, and a life that if anybody saw your life in five years, they'd go, I can't believe where they are. I can't believe that relationship. I can't believe how they turned their finances around, and I can't believe they've moved in the direction of their son or their daughter. This is, like, this is the only way. Like, this is the hard part about this message. All right, we have this belief that there's another way. There's not, there's just one way, which stinks. Jesus said, there's a narrow way. Few people wanna do this. 
Most people just wanna fight, figure it out on their own. There's only one way. It's just one truth, sacrifice to life. There's just one way and there's just one truth. And if you can figure that out, that's how you find life. So it's no wonder that Jesus told us that he is the way, and that he is the truth, and that he is the life. There's just one way, there's just one truth. And it's through him that we find life. Sacrifice always brings life. You know how you do it? Simple, it just takes faith. It takes faith to believe this. It just takes faith for us to trust this. Right? It takes courage. It's what a hero has to believe that you can deny yourself and sacrifice whatever it looks like for you. You guys know what faith is. Faith is just simply placing your whole weight on something. You gotta put your whole weight and your whole trust on the belief that sacrifice leads to life. And no, this is not easy. And yes, this is hard and it's difficult, but we already know what it is we want. If we just learn to take up our cross every single day and in every relationship and place our faith and trust in what Jesus said was true, you will never regret that decision. You'll never regret that decision of placing your trust and believing this and believing what Jesus demonstrated on the cross is also true for you. A sacrifice will always lead to life. So back to the question I asked you at the very beginning, what was the last heroic thing that you've done? What was the last heroic thing that you did? I think everybody in the room could have an answer to this question by the end of the day. You could have an answer to this question by the end of the week. You could have an answer to this question by the end of the month. And all you have to do is just make the call. All right, set up the appointment, say you're sorry, start complimenting, quit, stop, start, whatever it is that you feel like you need to do. So just as we close out today, I'm leaving you with these two questions. What is it that you wanna save? What is it that you wanna save? And what will you sacrifice to save it? What is it you wanna save? What is it that you know needs saving in your life? And what are you willing to sacrifice to save it? And some of you are like, I'm already in the middle of it and it's hard and I'm sacrificing and I'm trying to save it. Keep going. If you're sacrificing right now for a relationship, don't stop. When you follow Jesus to the cross, sometimes Friday and Saturday feel like a really long time, but I promise you Sunday will come. Sunday will come for you. There will be a resurrection. So what is it that you wanna save and what will you sacrifice to save it? The idea of sacrifice to life, this isn't just a belief we hold, but it's the life that we live. Jesus extends the invitation to every single one of us to come and follow me, All right? And he says, if you're willing to lose, losing is the new winning. If you're, wi if you're willing to lose, I promise you, you're gonna save your life, which is exactly what a hero does. A hero saves the day. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just pray for all of us this morning. This is such a difficult thing for us to do. None of us wanna sacrifice. None of us wanna suffer. None of us wanna go down that road. We know you didn't wanna do it. Thank you for being such an incredible example of the struggle it is for us to sacrifice for things that we know need saving. But Jesus, you set your face toward it and you ran after it, keeping your eyes on the resurrection, keeping your eyes on the life that awaited. And God, that's what I pray that all of us have the faith and the courage to do, to know that if we trust you and place our faith in you, that sacrifice will always lead to life. I just pray for the, the, the men and the women who are in situations and struggles right here where it just feels overwhelming. God, I pray that you give them courage and faith to believe and to know that Sunday's coming. God, thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the truth that's found in your word and in scripture. And God, I just pray that you just give us all the courage to do something significant with what we heard here this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Guys, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back next week for part five of Heroes. You guys are dismissed.